All right. Welcome, everybody. Despite all of our best efforts, we did have some technical difficulties there, and it looks like we have actually so many people trying to get into the chat uh, room that that's causing us a little trouble that we're going to try to resolve shortly. So if you could put the slides up, please. Okay, um, welcome, and you can go to the next slide, Ryan. First of all, I want to thank our, uh, my name is Ben Daly, and I'm the Chief Academic Officer for High Tech High. Um, I want to thank our partners at the Hewlett Foundation and at the Riggs Foundation who, without this, this would not be possible. I want to thank, uh, I want to acknowledge our partners on this project. We have the MIT Media Lab, Peer-to-Peer uh, -peer University, the Teaching Channel, and then we also have uh, 10 school organizations that are working in ver uh, various ways on this project. And those, those, proj those uh, organizations are Ed Visions, Expeditionary Learning, New Tech Network, Asia Society, Connect Ed, Big Picture, High Tech High, um, Envision Schools, uh, Internationals Network, and New Visions for Public Schools. Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my, uh, my name is Rob Gordon. <laughs> I'm the, um, well, I'll introduce myself in a moment. moment. But we do have a fabulous panel, panel here, here to, to uh, give us kind of an overview, overview and, and have a conversation about deep learning, learning, what it is, why we might want to look into it, how it relates to the common core, what the implications are for adults, how it looks from a student's perspective. But let's go right to our, our panel, panel. Um, um, and, and here's some here's introductions. I'm, 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 I'm going to be moderator, moderator. I'm Rob Reardon. I'm the I'm president of High Tech High School of Education, education which is an organization that, that attempts to model and foster uh, deeper, deeper learning. learning. Ed? Ed? Hi, I'm Ed Brisenio. I'm CEO of Mindset Works, uh, which was uh, founded by Carol Dweck and other educators to help schools foster student agency which is an inner drive to learn and grow, uh, to take charge over their own learning, and that's a core component of deeper learning. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm John Needham, professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I've uh, been doing a study of high schools in the US that are striving towards deeper learning. And we've been to about 30 schools, including a number of the ones on Ben's uh, initial list. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to talking about some of what we've seen there. Um, Larry Rosenstock, CEO of High Tech High, which is a, a group of uh, nonprofit independent public schools in Southern California. Hi, I'm Maya Irvin. I'm a 10th grade student at High Tech High. Um, and after getting the chance to go to a deeper learning um, conference um, beginning or end of last year, I decided with a friend that I'd love to be able to um, eventually publish a book about deeper learning from a student's perspective. My name is Mark Chun. I'm a program officer at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. And one of our main priorities is focusing on how we get deeper learning out for all students across the country. So, Mark, I mean, Hewlett has been very interested in uh, deeper learning and has really tried to get some, uh, some momentum going around and discussion going about, about it. Uh, my question to you is, I mean, we've had progressive education, constructivist education, inquiry-based learning, project-based learning, 21st century skills, so, and now we have deeper learning. So, why should we listen up? I mean, all these things are coming along. What, what is special or distinctive about uh, deeper learning and what makes it something that we should really be attending to? Sure. Well, I think when the foundation was getting started and trying to figure out what are the competencies that students need to succeed in college, career, and civic life, we came up with a set of the, the skills and knowledge and abilities that students would need in order to, to do that. And one of the things that we wanted to have was a big tent, so all those different groups could form underneath that, recognizing that there are a lot of these ideas that have gone back throughout like the last like 100 years, so that's something that we wanted to focus on. Also, in terms of deeper learning, we did want to get away from a lot of the distinctions that folks were making between skills and knowledge. So when we talked about 21st century skills or even the scan skills, it really highlighted that. We want to recognize that we need to have the knowledge, skills, and dispositions all together in order for students to have success. My name is Ryan Gallagher. I'm a teacher at High Tech High, so I'll just jump in while Rob's getting his fix. Um, so that's great. I think we've made the switch towards deeper learning. Um, I'd love to hear from the panel, maybe starting with Ed, about how your work kind of connects with this. How do you feel that, I know your work specifically with Mindsets Network is talking about academic mindsets and how that aligns with this kind of new idea of deeper learning versus 21st century skills versus scans. Sure, so uh, to me, you know, deeper learning is about 
a deep understanding of kind of deep understanding and mastery, so both the knowledge, the skills that Mark was talking about, and the dispositions that are that are needed for 21st century success. And that means creating, applying knowledge, creating new things, innovating, you know, building on knowledge, um, and as well as being a lifelong learner. And in order to get those outcomes, you, know, you need some deeper learning competencies that the Hewlett Foundation has identified, and we can talk about those. But some of those are about student agency, particularly academic mindsets and learning strategies and, and academic mindsets and learning strategies and habits is how I think about it. Uh, and that means that students take charge over their own learning, and that's important for deeper learning because learning happens in the learner's brain. So how engaged and active the learner is in the learning experience has a lot of impact over how much is learned and how much the, learn, the learner can transfer and apply that knowledge to other things. That's great. Now, Jal, you've had the experience and a lucky experience of kind of going into some of these different schools. What makes a deeper learning school or what makes a deeper learning student for you? So I think of deeper learning, <coughs> excuse me, at the, uh, at the intersection of essentially kind of three uh, parts. Uh, one part has to do with identity. Is this uh, is the task that the student is working on something that matters to them, that's meaningful, that's connected to their core self? Uh, and then a second part has to do with uh, mastery. Like, Have they built up some skills? Do they understand the knowledge in the domain that connects to notions of expertise and those sorts of things? And then the third part is about discovery. Like, is there, are they not just receiving knowledge, but creating knowledge, making new things, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, and it's really difficult to get, uh, to get all three of those uh, parts in the, same, uh, in the same equation. But uh, when it happens, it's incredibly uh, powerful for people. Um, I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about schools as we go forward. But uh, when I do professional development for adults, I often ask people, you know, can you just describe a powerful learning experience that you've had in your life? And uh, sometimes those, I would say at least half of those learning experiences have come either outside of school or through like Model UN or some kind of extracurricular. But they generally have those elements. There was sort of a moment in life where something hit them that was really powerful. Uh, then they got invested in it. They spent a lot of time on it. They built up some skills. And along the way, they discovered some things that they didn't know when they started. And so I think the challenge for classroom educators is kind of how would we create those experiences on a, on a regular basis. OK. It, it's striking I, to see, too. Oh, Larry, go ahead. Yeah, so Chal, uh, on that note of, of asking people that question, which I think is a great idea for everybody who's listening into this right now, uh, E.O. Wilson, the well well known uh, entomologist at the same university as Jal, uh, I interviewed him and I asked him what was the moment in a great scientist's life like his. He's 82 years old uh, that he got the interest in science, and he said for himself and the great scientists he knows, it was in childhood that he had the quote eurekaizing moment where the whole world opened up to him. And I asked him, how are schools presently organized in terms of giving rise to these Eureka Isaac moments? And he said, uh, you know, for the most part, they're not. And that, therefore, we need to look to the world outside of the school and make the walls as permeable as possible to the inside and the outside. Uh, a great example of, of what I would consider to be a great example of, of a deeper learning uh, project by a group of 50 students was something that Maya worked on last year as a ninth grader. Maya, can you just tell us a little bit about the wheel? I'd love to. Um, so uh, last year I was able to take part in a project that was both um, humanities and physics based. And so on the humanities side, we looked at the rise and fall of civilization. So the Mayans, the Romans, the Greeks, and the Easter Islanders. Um, and keeping in mind that this, the date of our exhibition was actually supposed to take place on the date of the 2012 Mayan apocalypse. Um, so that's sort of where they got the idea of this project. Um, and so on the humanity side, we looked at the rise and fall and what led to um, the different um, the different rises and, and um, falls, if that makes sense, of the civilizations. Um, and then on the physics side, we learned all about gears. So um, uh, why do teeth matter and, and the spokes on a gear and what that means and uh, rotations per minute and different things like that. Um, and then so based on a theory that we created, um, uh, for how civilizations rise and fall, we had to create um, a mechanism. Um, and so the mechanism could involve as many gears as you needed it um, in order to sort of uh, get your uh, theory across. 
and then each one of our little uh, mechanisms was connected to one larger gear. Um, and so basically, um, if you were to see it today, you see a big gear with a whole bunch of little um, sort of uh, families of gears connected to it. And so when the big gear turns, all of our smaller ones are turning at the same time. Um, so it's a lot to look at, but as soon as you hear a student talk about it or as soon as you know what's behind it, um, it's definitely um, something really cool. Um, and it taught us not only, not only were we learning about the Easter Islanders and the Greeks um, and physics, we were also learning, my, um, my individual mechanism didn't work on exhibition day when the whole school was there watching. Um, so it taught me that it was okay that I didn't finish it because my teacher said, I saw you one day, I stayed after school until about midnight trying to finish it with my teacher and two other friends. And so he said that I saw that he saw me working as hard as I could. So it didn't matter that it didn't work on exhibition day. It mattered that I had put in the work um, and that I had truly tried my hardest and I had to work, uh, work over all the obstacles that were thrown at me. Okay, I've got one more quick question for you, Maya. Okay. What's and, I said, and Ed, I, I'd like to follow up uh, on behalf of Rob and ask you the same one. I think a good, a good uh, inquiry is my what. What surprised you about all that? Was there some surprise that just you was something unexpected about the process or the outcome? That I could do it, um, <laughs> because I was in a group with three boys. One of them was all in it. He was he was like, "Tell me what to do, and I will do it for you." Because he didn't really know. How to, how to do it, but he knew that I knew how to take charge, and so he asked me what to do, and he did it. And the other two boys, they didn't do anything. They weren't really sure what to do, and they were the type of boys. There's a, there's a basic formula for a group, and I am very aware of that basic formula. And teachers don't try, um, don't try to create a, gr a group that way, but that's what ha ends up happening. So I was in a group with three other boys, and those two boys didn't really do anything. They were um, sort of the exception to that formula because it equaled Usually it only equals one person who doesn't do anything. I had two boys who didn't do anything. Um, so I it, I didn't think I could do it, to be honest. I thought that our, we weren't going to have a gear. Nothing was going to work. I wasn't going to be able to turn in all of the papers while trying to figure out how to use um, Adobe Illustrator and our big industrial uh, laser cutter. And so I didn't think I could do it. So the fact that I was able to persevere and help my group and communicate with my teacher in an effective way with both teachers to communicate with my parents really surprised me because I didn't think that I could do it all and I was always I've always been pretty sure of myself but that just proved to me that I can do a lot more and you are very sure of yourself which we know and love about you okay I'd like to ask uh, in, in sequence uh, Ed and then Jal and then Mark uh, could you give examples on the upside of things that you have seen inside schools that really surprised you in a really positive way about deeper learning and what was it about that that was so striking? Sure, um, so for me um, a wonderful deeper learning experience that I had was actually at High Tech High uh, and it was a project slice in, in front of uh, before uh, the deeper learning conference last year and the project that we worked on for a day was uh, to explore the issues in the Mexico-U.S. border, and so we went, uh, we went to Mexico, and we, you know, there was half of us who crossed the border and interviewed people there. Half of us uh, stayed in in the U.S. and and uh, interviewed people there, and and there was a whole process to this. Before the experience, we kind of asked questions and explored different artifacts to 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 figure out what we were interested in learning about. We went through a learning experience, and at the end of the day, we created some art that demonstrated something that that we had learned that day. And um, it, the the end result of that is is something that is not as predictable as when we are kind of saying, you know, lecturing one to thirty students. Uh, but the learning was was a lot deeper. So um, one of the um, one of the uh, students that was with me, who was a teacher, who was, she was a principal actually. Uh, we were working on our art and and she said you know uh, and, and she kind of we were talking about what we had learned that day and she had an aha moment that because she didn't speak Spanish she had uh, the level of her thinking about what had happened that day had been a lot lower than for the Spanish speakers in the room and that 
gave her an aha moment for the situation that English language learners are and the challenges on, on, on developing academic language to developing kind of the, the understanding of the of the standards that we want them to to learn. So that was a you know and, and a wonderful uh, experience where I didn't know exactly what to expect out of the day, but great deeper learning came out of it. Great, thank you. And you know, Ed, you might know that one of our students once said, "I'm not here illegally. They just moved the border to the other side of me." <laughs> Chal? Um, sure. Uh, I mean, I find that in in deeper learning settings, the 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 person who's organizing the learning tends to kind of be able to tilt things on its head or see things not in the way that you would have originally seen it. Uh, and the comment that Larry just made about moving the border, uh, that that's the kind of thing uh, that that um, one would think of in that case. So, for example, we went to a math science magnet school in Illinois, uh, which uh, and we were at a class which was a humanities class. And this guy, who was a fairly traditional teacher, he you know would read a little bit from the text, and then the students would discuss it a little bit and so forth. But what he was teaching was from uh, David Hume, and uh, David Hume teaches a lot about notions of causation, and David Hume's ideas are basically like just because the sun has come up for the last zillion days doesn't mean that you know for sure the sun's going to come up tomorrow. And so the assignment for that class was take one of the labs that you did in your science class and write about it from David Hume's perspective. Are those things that you think you figured out? Like, are you sure that you really figured them out after you've learned about Hume? And this guy, you know, he was like a, it's like teaching humanities at MIT or something. Like, you know, he was, this is a math science magnet school. He was the sort of the outcast. And he sort of found a way to kind of destabilize the whole enterprise by taking what he was teaching and then asking them to apply it uh, to their math uh, science work. So, I feel like deeper learning can happen in lots of different ways, but often that's, that's one quality of it. That's a great point in many different ways. And Mark, can you give us an example? Sure. Actually, I'm going to give two quick examples. Okay. And for one, with regard to deeper learning, and I don't think we've mentioned this yet, but at the foundation, what we've identified are six competencies that we have found that students need, which is understanding or mastering content, critical thinking and problem solving, communication, both written and oral, collaboration skills, uh, learning how to learn, and then the academic mindsets. And a great example, I think, was pivoting off of what Maya just said. I visited schools, and I would ask them, well, where do you see the students developing these skills? And they'd say, well, collaboration, obviously, it's happening right here. They're working on a group project. And, and Maya, you have to let me know if this happens with you. Oftentimes, folks will take the project. If there's four students, you cut it into four pieces. Each person goes off and maybe does their part. You cobble it back together, and you submit it. And that's not really the way that we're thinking about the teamwork and collaboration skills that students will need in the future. So sometimes there are examples where folks think they're focusing on helping students develop these skills, and they often aren't. That's one challenge. The other extreme, um, Ron Berger, one of our colleagues who works uh, with expeditionary learning, he reminds us, and I found this as well, that you go to any school across the country, and there are pockets of teachers and students who are doing this type of learning. One of Inventa, many of the schools within this deeper learning network, have been ticked off the different organizations. It's amazing how this is happening across the board. So it's happening for all students in all classrooms. And so it's not just a little group of students getting that, but everyone's getting it. And I find like that is the tremendous power of this work. So so um, one of the things that uh, that I would like to throw into the mix here is this is uh, give an example of this, is this question of social learning. Um, for some reason, I went to law school, and I've often asked people who've gone to law school if you could do if you if you could only do one of the following three things, and your life depended on getting through law school, would you attend the classes? Would you read the cases, or would you be in a study group? And almost everybody I ask that question to says be in a study group. So, could, would someone like to talk about this whole? notion, and Maya, you've seen this a lot in a lot of the projects here, but anyone on this question of the peer-to-peer -peer exchange, um, my nephew once said, of course, someone in the study group had better have read the cases, but he's a wise guy. Um, would someone like to pick up on that theme? I think that depends on the student. Yeah. Um, I know that, um, I think it depends on the student and the people who, you know, who you would be in the study group with. Um, personally, I know that, um, teachers 
teachers who have been hired to Kai for a while have gotten very, very good at sort of learning um, more about seating charts and where to sit people and can you work outside? I don't know. Um, I'm sort of students know now that that when t a teacher says that you can work that this student you can work outside and the student can. It's not because you're picking favorites. It's because this student has proven to the to the teacher that they can work outside and that they can, you know, sort of communicate um, with their peers. So I think that just depends on the type of student. And if uh, speaking with other students helps, um, then that's what the student's going to choose to do. But I'm not sure that that's always the case with every student. So, you know, when we have these conversations, we're talking a lot about what students are doing in terms of deeper learning in schools. What about uh, for you, you're, you're, you're in an interesting organization that you work for right now, what about the role of deeper learning for the adults in the organization that you're working in? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's something that we found characterizes a lot of the schools within the Deeper Learning Network, recognizing that the types of how you engage students, you need to apply the same practices for how we engage the adults within the buildings. So teachers and administrators still need to continue to learn as well. And it's just what you uh, raised earlier, that there's the aspect of the social learning opportunities for them to get together and plan and figure out how they can work with their students. So I think that's been a key part of what we learned, that this is not something where teachers need to be separated into their own silos and doing their own work. We need to find ways to engage them, have a chance to improve their practice and work together. Right. Okay. And what about, for those of you who know uh, Sam Seidel's a wonderful uh, work on, on, on hip hop and flipping out of something out of nothing. Uh, this what about this whole question of 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 uh, the remix, you know, um, and and the role of the remix in life today, and that that sort of whole notion of uh, of of building, tinkering, and remixing and sharing uh, in a way that we're doing today. Uh, uh, is that something, Ed, that you would want to try to tackle a little bit? This question of 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 of, share, of sharing and and collective. Uh, creation of new knowledge. Sure. So that I, I think um, is kind of like the the world works at its best. The real world, when people are are creating things that are of value for other people, uh, often you have people coming together and being energized and applying their different uh, skills in a collaborative way to create something that's of value for the world. And so what we are trying to do is mimic. Uh, that environment in schools so that students learn that way, learn to operate in the world and also create things that are of real, real value for the world. Okay, very, very good. Thank you so much. And I also see a question here from Mark, which is a good one, about this question of equity. Is this for everyone and can this be for everyone? Rob, the equity question has just been raised and it's a perfect moment for you to return. Yeah, well, in my view, um, the, the, the great project um, of High Tech High and the great project for uh, education everywhere is to uh, reach all students um, and to discover that all students are capable of, uh, of deeper learning. Um, and, I, and the question then becomes, how do we find ways to um, offer access and challenge to all learners and, uh, off, and ways that by which uh, all learners can uh, shine. So for me, that uh, that leads us to um, a couple of things. One is uh, to uh, students getting their hands on things and designing and building things, um, as in project-based learning. But doing projects and doing design and building itself is not enough. Um, there needs to be um, uh, some sense of a problem or a, a real question that we're pursuing. Uh, students need to f perceive uh, that they are engaged in authentic work uh, for an authentic uh, audience. Uh, so when those conditions are in place, um, th th we can have any, all, any and all students can have access um, and can realize that they have a voice um, in the design, in the definition, um, and in the uh, exposition. Uh, of, the, uh, of the problem. I'll stop there because I'm wondering, I know I'm wondering a little bit. Let me say, take a, take a shot at this question of equity. I think that, um, you know, what, what you want to have is a sense of imagination, intuition, and, and inspiration. And, and, and imagination and intuition and inspiration don't 
mispredict based on socioeconomic status. They don't mispredict based on race. They don't mispredict based on gender. They don't mispredict based on language ability. Those are sort of natural elements and talents that are all within us, but they're but they're not uh, drawn upon in in schools. I just uh, just have something I just took off my shelf. Uh, just because some of you have seen it before, but it's just a lot of fun. So here's, here is a, here's a case where, uh, okay, so Ryan, I want it to be on me, is it? Okay, so this is a book that some kids did, one of many books about the San Diego Bay, and these kids were asked to write a very interesting book and with photographs about the flora and fauna of San Diego Bay, and it's really professionally done. The most interesting page to me is this one in the mammal section. The kids noticed that there were homeless people living by the side of the bay. And they have a very respectful treatment of homeless people in the mammal section of the book. Most of us as adults would have seen the homeless people, of course, but it takes the freshness of, of, of the eyes of youth to notice the homeless people and respectfully include them in the book. And that's part of the, that to me, is part of the uh, is part of the the equitable part of the remix recreation and productive inquiry is that is that we all have something uh, we all have something to sort of bring to the party here. Hey, Jal, I'm going to go back to you now. I want to I want to ask you since you know you're um, you're in the academy, what are some of the more compelling? Is there any thing around a compelling research? that you are sort of tickled by these days that is a, that, that is examining some of these uh, questions of, about how how we not only learn but how we really learn uh, that is a uh, that's a really good question um, I mean I've been particularly interested over the past few years on the on the research uh, that uh, expertise accumulates uh, over time, um, but I, I think that this. I'm not trying to dodge your question, Larry, but okay. uh, but I think that this is a topic where kind of leading educators are ahead of uh, the sort of research and uh, writing about the topic, which is why I've spent a lot of time uh, in schools trying to learn uh, trying to learn from practice. Uh, I did want to say one quick thing, doubling back to your last question, though, about uh, equity, which is uh, one of the most kind of tragic things about uh, our school uh, visits is that if you go to visit a school for a day, and I encourage everybody to do this, to get out of your own school and go look, take a look at another school, uh, you'll notice two things. One, uh, unless it's uh, a school which is explicitly set up to do this kind of work, uh, you'll just notice very wide variability from classroom to classroom. So, you know, I remember once going to a school and I went to the history class and usually my first question is to a student. I just turn to the student and I say, you know, what, what's happening in this class? And the student said, well, you know, go ask that girl. She's the one who understands what's happening in this class. And, you know, I went over to her and she started to talk and I asked a question and she tried to read something out of her notes and it was just miserable for both of us. And then I was shadowing a student. I followed the student across the hallway to the next class, and it was a chemistry class. And the whole demeanor of everything changed. They said, you know, professor, you need to put on your goggles if you're going to be in this room. And they just like went to the materials and they started working. Like that's the way that room was. Um, so I, I just I frequently find that um, that the kids are ahead of the adults. That what the kids want to do, what they can think about. Usually, if you visit a school for a day, you get half an hour just to sit down with the kids in the cafeteria or whatever and talk to them about the school. Inevitably, no matter what school you're in, they are perceptive, witty, ironic, thoughtful, incisive, etc. And then you follow them into their some of their classes, and those qualities are not being permitted to uh, to come out. So I think the big challenge for equity is to sort of to uh, figure out ways to unleash that. I would love to hear Maya's perspective on this around the question of is this for everyone or is it simply for the fast moving students? Is it simply for the students who use their hands? What, if, Maya, what's your take on this from the student perspective? I, I, um, I definitely believe it's for everybody. I think that it's a little, um, I don't know, it's a little strange to just say that it's only for the fast moving student or for the high tech high student. I think that every student can learn um, how to collaborate 
um, and how to sort of um, work together. Um, and I just think that Haitakai has its own way, and I think that there, Haitakai isn't, you know, the only way to do it. I think that there are a bunch of other ways. Um, and so I think that it's for, I think it's for every student. I think that it does take, um, uh, it's a process, you know. Um, I've been at the school since I was in fourth grade, so I've, I'm used to project-based learning, and I don't really remember what public school is like. Um, so, I mean, it, I now I've, I've gone through the process. I'm in tenth grade, and I'm used to it. But, you know, I don't believe that to say that is to say that, you know, nobody else can do it. I think that it's just, it's a process, and I think that, um, you know, if if um, if they work hard enough and if they're really um, motivated, and even if they're not, I think there's always a way for every student to sort of, um, yeah, to, cool. for it to work. Great. Thanks, Maya. I think, Ed, I think you wanted to say something about this as well. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with Maya. I think that this is this is for every student. Every student has the capability of developing those deeper learning competencies that Mark talked about. And Maya said, you know, if they're motivated, and then she said, well, if if they're not motivated too, and that's that's what I encounter as a as as skepticism from educators or others most often if in deeper learning is well you know what I can put these projects in front of students I can create these great learning experiences for them but some of them are just sitting back and they don't care and you know if I were in their shoes I'd be so excited because it would be so cool to, to be learning about all these things but they're not engaged and and that that is a challenge, but the, the key is that we can motive we, we can develop in students that inner drive, that motivation for them to make the most out of those learning experiences. And and some some things that are important to develop that inner drive and motivation are academic mindsets, uh, which are four key beliefs. I can change my intelligence and abilities through effort, which is a growth mindset. I can succeed. I belong in this learning community and this work has value and purpose for me. That along with effective self-management and learning strategies and habits unleashes that inner motivation and so we have to be ex deliberate about creating environments that fosters those beliefs and strategies in students so that they take ownership over their learning and then yes, I believe that this can be you know, the best way for students to, to learn. And I would also Thank say you. that, that is, there is not one way to, to to create deeper learning. Different schools can design themselves in different ways to create deeper learning experiences and outcomes for students. So, so Ed, thank you. And this this actually takes us back to what Joel was saying earlier about the, the different uh, settings that you move into even within one school and speaks to the centrality of the teacher in, in creating an environment where students feel that their input is valued, where collaboration is is the is the norm um, for the day, and where uh, where important questions are being uh, pursued, I, I want to shift gears a little bit um, and ask about the adults. Um, what about the adults in schools? What what needs to happen with and for adults um, and, and if we are to um, foster and model? deeper learning. One of the great, I mean, to me, the great irony in schools today is that we're asking teachers to foster and model deeper learning um, and 21st century skills, and they're working in a 19th century work environment. But what needs to happen uh, for the adults? And how can administrators and other leaders um, help adults in their efforts to foster deeper learning? Anybody? Well, I'll take a quick shot at that. I think the most important thing is for the adults to to no longer be working in autonomous isolation and to be working collegially in groups. Um, and I also think that they should not be in the stovepipe of their own uh, discipline, but rather they should be doing work uh, that crosses disciplines because that's how we experience the world. It's not, this is the math part, this is the science part, this is the history part, this is the whatever part. So I think, if, I think people need to be meeting. There's no other way. I don't think you can really do this unless the adults are collaborating and reflecting, uh, doing tunings of projects, seeing whether the project, not only whether it needs to be tuned, whether it's worthwhile to do in the very first place. Uh, so uh, those are types of things that normally don't happen in schools. And, and you know, Rob, we've been in schools where you check your mailbox, you teach your class in autonomous isolation, and you go home. That's a tough environment to make it happen. Yeah. 
I think it's important to add really quickly that everything that Larry just mentioned that's, that teachers need to do, students are doing at Hectic High. So I just, that personally, I find that very interesting. Um, and I, I think that maybe that's what helps teachers become so good at, at this, deep, this concept of deeper learning, um, is that they are doing what they're asking their students to do, which I think really helps. Yeah, so to pick up on Maya's point about modeling, uh, we tend to find that the relationship between the teachers and the administrators parallels the relationship between the students and the teachers. We call that symmetry. So in schools where the teachers are afraid of the administrators, the students are afraid of the teachers. And in the schools where the teachers really respect the students, usually they also have experienced that same level of respect from their uh, administrators. Um, one thing I, I learned from my own students, I teach a class at the Harvard Graduate School of Education on uh, deeper learning, and if you put in the course catalog that you're going to teach a class in deeper learning, it can't just be the readings, like you, you've got to deliver. <laughs> uh, and uh, one of the things, so we, we did, you know, we watched some videos and students did a long kind of design project which with, with a lot of the elements that Maya emphasized, a lot of struggle along the way and uncertainty and ambiguity and not sure if they could do it and presenting before a real audience and some of that went well and some of it didn't go well and, and clearly the experience of going through that project especially the parts that didn't go well but being in an environment where we had stress that you know you hit you get three hits out of ten you're in the Hall of Fame in baseball like that's the way you want to think about it we're just gonna create an environment we're gonna try things out and uh, just keep working on it and what they said to me was you know we learned something from the readings but we mainly learned about deeper learning because we kind of live deeper learning and so their challenge going forward is like if most school is gray and they've now experienced orange a lot of them want to become school principals and so on they can't just say to their teachers you know let's do orange like you know some of their teachers different points in their schooling may have experienced some orange but they are going to have to create experiences for those people which are sort of similar to the kinds of experiences they went through and so forth. So sort of like pay it forward like, you know, if Maya were to grow up and run a school, I'd have a lot of confidence in it because she spent so long being immersed in this kind of an environment. I think I'd have a lot of confidence in Maya as yeah. well. She's ready, she, so, she's, thank you. She's, she'll, she's ready to run as one of these schools right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I want to... I want to. There, there's an interesting uh, question that's come through from uh, from our chat line here. Um, how do we identify the real questions that bring meaning meaning to uh, students' learning? Um, and um, I don't want to take anybody by surprise, but let's think about that for a second. And I have a thought about it. Um, and that thought is to go to the students and ask them what their questions are. That's what just um, came to mind. <laughs> okay, we've had we've had um, uh, we've seen uh, really profound, profoundly deep project-based learning where the teachers went in without a notion of what the curriculum might be, what the gen what the generative questions might be, and simply said to kids, sixth graders, kindergartners, and twelfth graders. We've seen it at all those levels. Teacher goes in and says, "What are your questions about yourself and about?" the world and we and gather those all together up on the whiteboard and categorize them and bring them all together into one kind of overarching question that kind of links all the questions and then proceed from there. Those are questions that have real meaning to students and that have real currency in the world beyond school. In the sixth grade class that we were talking about, they all realized that their questions were all linked to the end of the world. Um, and they studied the Mayan calendar, they studied earthquakes, they studied tsunamis, they studied supernovas, they surveyed asteroids, all, and they presented all, all these different things, but they all related to questions that they, had, they themselves had brought uh, to the table. Others on that issue, identifying real questions that bring meaning to the learning. I just want to. I just want to say, that is the whole reason that that I was interested in writing a book from a student's perspective. Because when my friend and I went to the deeper learning conference, there were a lot of questions being posed that we turned to each other and we went, "Well, wait a second. I'm pretty sure that I could give you at least, if not the answer, at least part of the answer." And we started to feel a little. Um, we didn't know if we were naive or if we really, you know, could give you the answer. Um, so I think that that's the biggest reason why we thought it was important to have 
a book from a student's perspective to maybe possibly just try to help answer some of these questions because I think that um, my mom's an educator. My mom's been an educator for about 16 years. She's now the dean at one of the high-tech high schools. And so I've, I've seen her work in a public school, and I've seen her work in high-tech high. -tech high. Um, and so I, I've, I've heard her have conversations about her curriculum and how she's teaching and, and what she struggles with. And so I think that sometimes as, as educators, um, you, you forget to go to the student and ask a question. And so I think that's, again, like, like students have to learn how to, how to you know, sort of maneuver their way through deeper learning. That's what educators have to do as well. And so I think that sometimes it's forgotten that the students are the ones who are most affected by deeper learning. Maya, that's very helpful. Thank you. And I think there's a lesson there, too, uh, not only about curriculum and what questions to pose and pursue, but also about assessment. Um, and that if we're talking about deeper learning, then assessment takes on a different cast. And assessment is not only about how are the students doing, but how is this experience and how is this course and this design working for the students? So that not only are we looking at student work, but students are looking at the design work that, we've put, that we as adults have put together uh, around this learning experience. Is it working or not? Any other uh, comments about assessment 2.0, if if <laughs> or 3.0? Um, well, how would we how would we know that deeper learning is going on? Uh, how would we get at that? I think, uh, as the saying goes, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting, and I think that looking at student work is a very powerful way to understand what's really going on. See what they've done themselves. I think it gives new meaning to uh, parent participation. It gives new meaning to, uh, to uh, accountability uh, in schools. It gives new meaning to use of public dollars for schools to actually see what students are, are, are doing themselves. Uh, we've certainly found that to be the case here where a lot of people in the early going were questioning what we were doing. And then when they saw the books that they published and the patents that they got and things like that, they said, well, it's different than the way I went to school, but this is really interesting. That would be my take. Yeah. Mine continues to be uh, assessment is dialogical and it's mutual, that it goes both ways. Um, I want to I want to raise one other question. I know that we're drawing near to the end of our time here, but I know, uh, and I would love Mark to ch uh, chime in on this, and Larry, and anybody else who's interested. I just want to bring up the notion of standards. Um, in the in the United States, the emergence of Common Core. In in other countries, I know that standards are um, are a piece of the picture, uh, and I know that many educators feel constrained by standards and, uh, and beholden to them in such a way that they can't do the kinds of things that they really want to do. So what about deeper learning and standards? And in this country, deeper learning and the common core standards that are coming through. Larry, let me uh, ask you to lead off on that. OK, I'll go first. Uh, I, I remember when the term was first <laughs> used and being in a meeting with several people about it. And there were a few of us who said, instead of the word standards, why don't we have the word expectations? And the person who wanted the word standards says, what's wrong with standards? And we said, well, you know, we're all wordsmithers here. And if you add a few letters to standards, you get standardization. And standardization, in some regards, is, is the death knell of, of innovation um, in, in anywhere and, and in education as well. So, uh, so now we have a new set of standards that are, you know, fewer, higher, better. And, and, and I'm very fond of some of the people who've created them uh, personally. But I'm not sure uh, that that's really going to move the needle as much as a lot of people hope. Pardon my cynicism about that. I think that I think that there's a lot of ways that you can be accountable. And and the, and the, the greatest risk for standards is that they devolve into content standards rather than process standards, in my opinion. So, um, Mark, I, I wonder if you'd like to inject a more hopeful note. Uh, fewer, <laughs> higher, better. Um, <laughs> What's your take? Um, sure. I do think that like, linking the last two bits of the conversation together, that like standards or expectations, um, is another great way to think about it, that is also linked to the notion of assessment. So before we assess, we need to know what we're assessing for. And so this conversation on standards is really about what are the core things that we want to make sure that all of our students 
know, are able to do, and the way in which they approach their work. Yeah. So if we think about it in those terms, let's, let's set aside the vocabulary that might be daunting us on standards, but we clearly need to know what, what matters to us, what matters for our students, and assessment needs to link to that. So I think when we think about assessment for deeper learning, the key part is the process. That first we have to pause and stop and say, what does it really mean for our students to be critical thinkers? What would yeah. it look like if they can collaborate and communicate well? And yeah. we, we need to do that assessment so we can check, like, did we actually do what we hope to do? Yeah. And then, of course, what would it mean for the assessment to be part of the learning? Um, I mean, one of the things I, w I would... I recommend to anyone who's engaged in teaching and learning with is to is to ask students um, what is the best piece of feedback or assessment that you've ever had on your work, um, and hear and hear what it is, hear what seems to be useful assessment. Um, we asked that question the other night in a pan at one of our graduate school courses here. We had a panel of students in and asked that question and. And it's very interesting kind of the resp students refer to moments, things that were said, things that were said in dialogue, not about not, and not about not to test scores um, and so on. One student said, um, "We were working on a project together. I love to work in groups. I love to take leadership." My teacher pulled me aside and said, "You know, you're doing a lot of work in this group and you're leading wonderfully, but." The others aren't having quite the chance that they might need to step up. If you would step back a little bit and see what would happen, you would see the student said that feedback changed the way I work in groups and changed my view of myself in groups. I was never the same um, in group work. That was what was meaningful assessment and meaningful uh, feedback to her. 21st century activities, 21st century uh, observation and response, and and she felt that her way of dealing with groups and dealing with the world was had had been changed. So can I just add a couple of thoughts on the standards and assessment uh, points? Yeah, please, John. People said. So um, our studies of high schools, uh, teachers consistently tell us the things that hold them back from deeper learning are day tests and also college expectations, the uh, um, sets of SAT twos uh, and APs are a very complicated topic, but uh, expectations set elsewhere as to what their students should be learning, which generally push them to cover a lot of things superficially, which is the kind of antithesis of deeper learning. So there clearly needs to be some serious rethinking of that kind of a system if we want um, if we want it. And then the other thing that the thing that my thought on the word standards is that it seems like in the best learning experience, the, the field sets the standards. So like if you're trying to make a robot or write a field guide or perform a piece of music, like contained within music, engineering, uh, writing, those things have standards. And so if you make those things the standards, then the teacher can become the coach and the teachers are sort of helping the students. It's not the student trying to please the teacher anymore. It's the teacher working with the student to try to meet the standards that are essentially set by the field. And since adolescents are sort of aspiring young adults, they want to be uh, adults in certain respects, when they get welcomed into the world of adult standards, when they can play a piece of music, uh, create a, a robot, write a field guide that somebody might buy in a San Diego bookstore, uh, write a book about deeper learning, those are really powerful. And then when you start giving feedback, people become really interested in your feedback because they're working towards something that they care about. Very interesting, Joel. I mean, one of the things that we, one of our thoughts about standards here at Hitech High has been we want our students to be standard setters, not, not simply hmm. standards meters. What we're really after is the internalization of standards and the setting of internal standards rather than simply the response to externally imposed, ex, uh, imposed standards. So, and, and what we're seeing, of course, is that as the students' work goes out into the world and they're working from their internal standards, th those, they are also working towards the standards of the field as well. I wonder if we could just do a very quick um, final word kind of thing. Uh, if we just quickly go around, one more thing that you'd quickly like to say um, that uh, uh, to, to wrap things up, and you may pass if you wish as well. Sure, so I'll take a stab. Uh, one thing that I think has been helpful for me, because when we talk about deeper learning, we, we talk about a lot of things, and um, one way that I categorize all those things 
are on a spectrum from inputs to outputs, um, with outputs, you know, one output being success in work and life in the 21st century, and you know, other things that are related to that, like a deep understanding and the ability to apply knowledge and to innovate and create new things, um, and and leading to that. So those will be kind of, for me, deeper learning outcomes then in order to get those outcomes, you need deeper learning competencies, uh, which is what the Hewlett Foundation has identified as those six critical pieces of deeper learning. And then in order to get that, you need kind of deeper learning strategies, which are a long list of strategies that different schools can use in different ways, like project-based learnings, engage with experts, uh, teach academic mindsets, uh, design solutions to real problems, etc. And so that might be, as, as we're talking about a lot of things in this, in this MOOC, about deeper learning, that might be one one framework to categorize all those things. Okay, thanks, Edward. Uh, Ed, anybody else? Uh, yeah, Larry, I'd like comments. to I'd like to say a quick thing about it. You know, I, I what I what I hope is that is that we get to this place that we all feel when when, when we've had a deeper a deep learning experience, which is sort of the sense of, of everything falling into place, like having solved a riddle, and, and a sense where our imagination left to uh, left led to sort of an epiphany and and to, and to a sense of awe. That's what I that's what I hope that we would would wish for, and that's what I hope we would all find for ourselves and for our students. Uh, just two quick thoughts. One, um, despite the fact that there, at the moment, at least in the U.S. schools, uh, there's not that much deeper learning out there. Uh, when there is, it's really powerful. When you ask people about powerful learning experiences in their lives, they often don't just tell you about the learning, they tell you about how it changed themselves. So what we're striving for is really powerful and important. Uh, and then the really concrete thing, uh, in my class, students said the most helpful thing with respect to learning about deeper learning was seeing it. Uh, seeing it and doing it. But first seeing it and then doing it. So uh, there's nothing that we can say that would be as good as spending... If you had spent this hour with Maya and her three uh, classmates, even if they weren't all uh, working full on, you probably would have gotten more about deeper learning than listening to all of us uh, talking about it. So I would strongly, strongly encourage folks, find other teachers, find other schools, find places to look, and then just start trying things out. And I just got a text from Maya's mother that she is one very proud mama watching this. <laughs> well, she might be. I want to jump in really quickly. I, I do think that ultimately we know that there's some schools where this is happening and some students are getting it and a lot of students are not just as, as mentioned i do think that the notion of deeper learning like this is ultimately a social justice issue it's the equity themes that have permeated this conversation that we need to find ways for everyone to have this because otherwise they're going to be left behind when we think about what the challenges are moving forward in the world and we need everybody to be engaged in this great thank you mark for yeah. bringing us grounding us back in reality. And Maya, any quick last comments here? Um, I feel so lucky to um, be able to um, to communicate with educators um, as a student so that I can hopefully eventually by my senior year have, um, have cut down on the amount of times that I feel naive and that I know what I'm talking about. Um, and um, I feel very, very privileged to be able to grow up in this age where deeper, where um, so many more people are, are passionate about how I learn and, and, and hopefully it'll help me in the future. So I look forward to getting to talk to um, everybody on the panel and hopefully hearing more um, from the people who are watching because I'd love to love to learn more about um, deeper learning and how I can help um, when I grow up. Maya, thank you, and thank you for being with us. I want to acknowledge Camille Farrington, who has been with us, but whose audio has had problems and so has not been able to contribute, but has been there and present and has a lot to say about deeper learning mindsets, the implications for adults, uh, and so forth, a lot of wisdom to offer. So maybe we'll find a way uh, to bring uh, Camille into the game um, at, a, at a later time. At this point, uh, with thanks to all panelists, um, and apologies for our late tech start, um, and which has caused our overrunning a little bit because we wanted to give you your full time. I would like to turn it over to, is it Ben or to Ryan, uh, who's going to kind of wrap up here? It's me. Thanks, Rob. Um, just the two aspects of deeper learning that I want to um, 
highlight about things that are already happen happening within the deeper learning MOOC. Uh, to me, one part of deeper learning is doing something, so it's not just reading something or just hearing information, it's going out and, and actually using it in some way. And another piece is about the idea that knowledge is socially constructed, which is a fancy way of saying that we need to talk to other people in order to really learn deeply. And so um, a couple things I want to highlight from the doing something that have been happening, and you can go to the next one. Um, Maureen uh, Devlin is a fourth grade teacher who has created a whole week-long um, curriculum of how she's going to work with her fourth graders on deeper learning. Love it. Also, we have next um, Simon Fogg, who is in the early running for most, um, most engaged deeper learning MOOC participant, who made a map. And you can go to the next one and see the, um, the map, which shows where all of the uh, current participants are. And please, if you're uh, participating with us, please add yourself to this map. You can find it back, um, back uh, within the Google Plus community or on the website, I'm sure. And next up, um, Kevin Hodgson created uh, using Vialogs, which I believe is a, uh, a university, uh, a Columbia University tool, where you can watch the video that we had recommended, but you can also um, add in, as you're watching, you can put in um, your thoughts about it. So these are all great ways of people kind of doing something with knowledge and, and um, contributing for all of our learning. And then I also want to talk about some ways that we are constructing knowledge together or giving a chance to talk. So you can forward two more, please, Ryan. Um, and so one is about, um, we really want to encourage you to join uh, a small group. And you can see there's a few on the screen right now, but we have groups for high school, for elementary school, for Australian educators, a variety of uh, librarians I saw. So jump into a group or more than one. Uh, we think that would be a great way to kind of break down the madness of a thousand plus people all contributing in the, in the larger community. And next up, I wanted to highlight the the Boston area um, meetup. Uh, Dan Wise, who's at Tufts University, has been trying to organize um, this group. And so, if, if you're interested in, in meeting with other people in your local com in your local uh, area, um, we want to encourage that kind of behavior because I think there's something about online and there's also something about face to face that we want to encourage. Next up. Um, we also know that there are uh, schools where teachers and, and administrators are getting together to talk about the work that they're they're thinking about from doing the readings, from watching videos, from, from watching these panel discussions. And so um, Cambridge and Latin was one place that we saw. We know La Jolla Country Day. We know the big, uh, there's a big picture school where people are doing this. I think um, teachers at High Tech Middle Chula Vista, as we speak, are gathered in a conference room. A little woo-woo to them. Uh, next up. Oh, I just wanted to highlight this this comment that Peter Jana wrote. He he was talking about how the Sully Breaks video uh, made him think about teacher passion and uh, and student passion and how what's the intersection and where is the overlap and where is there tension around that. So I thought that was a very thoughtful post. And last but not least, uh, if you're not a Twitter user, I encourage you to go check out um, Twitter where we have the tweet of the weeks. Lots of people are posting their most significant learning experience. Three that I liked, uh, Estrella Lopez Aguilar wrote about learning to, learning a lot from teaching an eight-year-old about how to play the piano when, when she was an 11-year-old. Also, Tim Flanagan talking about creating a poetry anthology in the 10th grade. And then my favorite, um, Chelsea Waite, talking about a sixth grade, treat, uh, sixth grade teacher drinking horse pee in class. And I'm just gonna leave you, your imagination to be tantalized by that possibility. I would just say next week we'll be talking about looking at student work and we have a fantastic panel that's assembled. Thank you everybody. We're sorry about the tech issues. We'll be sure to work everything out for next week and thanks for the uh, for our esteemed panel and for Rob. Uh, it was fantastic. We'll see you all next week, same time.